We are about to start the session called Maure Galicia, Jewish learning, 16th, 20th centuries. Maure Galicia, of course, everybody here should know. It's the name of the monumental uh, series of, of, of uh, volumes about uh, Galician, Galician rabbis uh, com uh, written by Rabbi Meir Wunder. Uh, who, who is not here, but I know he is involved in the project of uh, uh, of this uh, society uh, uh, for Galicia, Galicia Jews. So uh, we have um, four, four um, papers to be presented here, and the first one is Tamara, Doctor Tamara Morsel Eisenberg. Let me introduce you. First and foremost, for myself, it's the first time she, that I, I, I have the opportunity to meet you. Uh, Tamara is a historian of early modern Jewry. She studies the intellectual and cultural history of Ashkenaz, especially the expression of its uh, development for the scholarship and dissemination of halakha. Uh, Tamara is a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows and a star fellow at Harvard Center for Judaic Studies, as well as a Berkovich Fellow at NYU Law. Uh, she will be starting as an assistant professor at NYU Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies in this fall. So, Birkata uh, Derech for you. And Tamara will speak about Rabbi Moshe Iserlish, Remo, Rema, Remu, and the transformation of Ashkenazic Alacha in Poland will be uh, uh, followed by presentation. So you need a dog or this no, will be this good enough? Fine. this is fine, okay. thank you. Thank you so much for this introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, Iris was saying before that we're doing this panel chronologically, is that if we did the conference chronologically, I would have had to open this conference, I think. I'm really very early on, um, arguably probably pre-Galicia in a way, if we're thinking of it as that definition, but I think um, Rama definitely deserves a place as a cultural hero um, in that sense. And um, what I would like to focus on a little bit today in terms of the transformation he made for Ashkenazi Kalacha, both in um, transitioning it from medieval German lands, um, transitioning it, but also in a sense declaring some sort of independence from it and moving on, and the transformation he makes in the halachic literature. Um, and as a kind of unification of maybe what we can think about as a, a, a unified pan-Ashkenazic halachic identity that has perhaps less regional distinction internally, but they can stand on its own um, as a halachic tradition. Um, and the way I want to discuss it today is to kind of take a very close-up view of how this happens um, by um, looking at a very specific story um, and this is a story of a wedding that Rama carried out um, on Shabbat. And very often this is a sort of a famous story and it's often presented um, and discussed as an example of um, Rama as a rabbinic personality. That um, his courage, his um, mercy on the orphan for who he's, con who he's conducting this wedding um, and uh, his daring and the way in which he did this and um, what I would like to add to this picture today is to maybe go beyond this idea of a, a characterization of rabbinic personality and to look at his character and is he stringent, is he lenient, is he sort of a nice guy, is he not? Um, I really to think of it how he does this in terms of the halachic transformation that he's bring a, bringing about. Um, so as I said, it's kind of a famous, um, a famous story of a wedding that, he, that was conducted on a, <laughs> first it starts out on a Friday um, and it gets later and later, and then it ends up being Shabbat, and he um, carries out the wedding on Shabbat. Um, what I would like to do is to look at this story, to look at how um, there will be three sections and then a fourth one. So the action itself, the thing he, he does, um, and then the justification of it in a rabbinic responsum, in a tshuva, um, in which he, as we'll see, it's not exactly a tshuva, it's a special kind of tshuva, um, in which he explains why he did why, what he did, and he explains it legally, 
Um, and then the third stage, which is the codification, where he inserts it into the Shulchan Aruch, into the famous code of law that was being written at the time as a sort of gloss. And we'll see there too, it's a bit of an excep exceptional gloss because um, you can see very much how he pushes it in there. Um, and then we'll take a little look back and a little look forward to try to understand the significance of this transformation that he carries out. Um, so first to the action itself. Um, this is in his um, responsa, which was printed uh, after he passed away. Um, but here it is described. Um, and as I said, this one is a little bit different from the usual um, responsa because it's written, usually responsa start out as a letter from usually one rabbi to another about a case. In this case, um, what you get, it's more presented as an open letter. Right? It's a justification. And we have the framework where he explains why he's writing it. Then you have the case that he describes, and then you have the legal justification in the case. And here is the framework. Um, he carried out this act, and clearly people were talking about it. He says, I heard behind me the sound of a great noise. They let a voice go around in the camp saying, look at Moshe, Moshe Solis, obviously, regarding the deed that was done by me recently when I arranged a marriage beneath the canopy, as is the way of the world. And it was late at night, the night of Shabbat, about an hour and a half into the night, and the deed and the reason that forced me to do so is known and revealed to all those who enter the gates of our town. And this is the deed that was done. So he gives this sort of public declaration. And then he describes with a lot of drama the actual case. And this is it in the tshuva. And here it is. Um, there was once a man in the land. And you feel it almost he's, he's telling a story. right? And he lost his money. And it was in the days that a match was sought for his daughter, and the father went to the world to come. He died. The daughter remained bereft and lonely. And it was when the days of her marriage came to pass, she saw no sign of the dowry, except for a voice telling her to immerse and prepare herself for her wedding. So while all these discussions are going on about the dowry between the different wedding parties, the women are telling her to start preparing for her wedding. Um, and, she, and this maiden did as she was commanded by her female neighbors, and they covered her on Friday with a veil, as is the way of maidens. And as the evening shadows lengthened, and the day was almost over, the relatives closed their fists, and there was missing from the dowry almost one third of the dowry. And the groom, too, his heart did not he heed what the town leaders were saying to him, telling him not to humiliate a daughter of Israel because of abhorrent money. And as a result, time was passing by, and the works of Satan succeeded until the time finally arrived. So the shadows are getting longer, it's getting closer to Shabbat time, and the groom agreed to come to the marriage canopy. And so as not to, but now, by now it's already Shabbat, and as so as not to humiliate an upright daughter of Israel, I stood up and officiated the marriage at the aforementioned time. So he carried out a wedding on Shabbat. As I said, he describes this sort of with a lot of drama. Um, this is the act, right? This is what happened. Now, how does he, justify this. After this happens, as he said, people were talking, everyone in the town was talking about what he did and said he did something wrong. And that's why he's sitting down now to write his explanation of what he did wrong. Um, so he has to go ahead and form a halachic justification of what he did. Of course, we can't go into the whole halachic discussion, but um, right, so here's the conclusion. And as people were um, complaining, now I will write to you right, the, what he relied on halachically. I can't give you, obviously, the whole halachic discussion, so just remember this. There are two main arguments that he needs to make. One of them is the fact, right, there's one reason why you cannot have a wedding on Shabbat. It's in the Babylonian Talmud, and it discusses different acts that one shouldn't do on Shabbat. Um, even though they're not strictly prohibited, you shouldn't do them on Shabbat because they can lead to something problematic. And they have different categories there, things that are mitzvah, things that are completely optional, and then I have a category in the middle which is not quite a mitzvah, not quite optional. And among this category in the middle is to marry. Right? One doesn't marry on Shabbat. They say you shouldn't marry on Shabbat even though it's not completely obligatory, it's not completely optional. Don't do it on Shabbat because it might lead to writing, because you might write out the wedding contract. Right? Later on, of course, they ask the question, what do you mean marrying is not a mitzvah? It's not a commandment. Of course, getting married is a positive commandment. You should be fruitful and multiply. You need to do all this. And this leads to the option, which is discussed in the rabbinic literature later, that maybe this only applies to people who already were married. 
And since you already had a wife or you already had children, getting married to a second wife or getting remarried or having more children, that is not so urgent and therefore you should not do it on Shabbat. And this is the track that Rabbi Moshe Isilis takes. He takes the interpretation that if somebody was never married before, you can get married on Shabbat because you're doing a positive commandment. But you're doing something positive and the thing that it says here that you should not get married on Shabbat is only if you already got married. So that is sort of the first side of the argument that he has to take. The second source that he has to contend with is in the Jerusalem Talmud. And there, the problem with marrying on Shabbat has nothing to do with writing. The problem with marrying on Shabbat is because it looks like purchasing something. Because when the husband gets married, he receives the right to his wife's property, and it resembles purchasing. Now, as I said, he has to deal with both of these. First, he deals with the first one in the Babylonian Talmud. And the way he deals with this, as I said, is he says, this is only if the person was already married. If the person is single and doesn't have children, it's okay to let him get married on Shabbat. The source he relies on for this is Rabbeinu Tam, the medieval famous Tosafist. And the discussion there is whether, again, whether someone who is not married, can, who wasn't married before, can get married on Shabbat. The problem with this interpretation is that Rashi thinks that all kinds of marriages are forbidden. And the Tosafist way who is right, is Rashi right and all marriages shouldn't be carried out, or is Rabbeinu Tam right and you could get married if you were never married before? Of course, Rabbi Moshe Silis is going to take Rabbeinu Tam's side because that supports the fact that someone who was never married before could get married on Shabbat if there is need to do so. The problem is that in the process of discussing who might be right and who might not be right, um, more evidence is brought for Rashi being right. And one of the evidence is this case from the Jerusalem Talmud. So how does Rabbi Moshe Silas deal with it? The Babylonian Talmud, as I said, he goes with Rabbeinu Tam. He says Rabbeinu Tam has a precedent that you could indeed get married if you were never before married before, and he follows that one. What does he do about the Jerusalem Talmud? He says, our Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, has pri primacy over the Jerusalem Talmud, and when they disagree, we don't need to take the Jerusalem Talmud into consideration. Now, what is the reason that he can make this argument? He says, this is a case of great need, Tzorich Gadol, and the other sort of reason he brings for why he argues this way is that it's great need and Gadol Kvod Habriot, the honor of creatures or people in this case, for someone to prevent someone from being humiliated is great. And that explains also why he describes this case with so much drama that the bride is already ready, she's wearing the veil already, she's about to get married. Um, how could we cancel this wedding and call it off? But he says, if I would push it off to after Shabbat, it might never happen. They might just drop the whole wedding. She's a poor orphan. And therefore, he says, I will sign with Albein Utam. We don't need to take um, the Jerusalem Talmud into consideration. And this is how he closes his decision. Right? And he concludes the response by saying, he concludes the response by saying, from all the above, it has been made clear that it is permitted to perform a marriage on Shabbat in a situation of dire need, and where there is a reason to fear for honor, so that things do not lead to humiliation. And we can rely on Rabbi Nutam, who is lenient about this. Having made his case, Isolis mentions that many marriages actually took place on Friday, and the festivities often ended very late, and finds it remarkable that only about him they complained. But this is how he managed to end his responsum. Right. All right, here we go. So he says, right, he, or who, he who relies on this will not lose out, and he shall delight in peace in the delight of Shabbat, and afterward, of Shabbat afterwards. And the positive commandment, so the fact that he got married, can atone for him, as long as it intention was for the sake of heaven. And Shalom, Moshe, son of my master, my father, Rabbi Israelis of blessed memory, he was named Moshe Israelis of Krakow. And thus ends the responsum. Now, this whole responsum, that is several pages long, makes his way into Shulchan Aruch. And as I said, here too, it's a bit of a special case because um, usually we think of Shulchan Aruch as a code as being very streamlined and very seamless and sort of not noticing, right, not noticing the concreteness of cases so much coming in. But in this case, the way in which the gloss comes in is actually, um, you can see the seams, so to speak. You can see how he 
brings this responsum and sort of pushes it in. Because as we know, the Shulchan Aruch is written by Rabbi Yosef Karo, and Rabbi Moshe Salis adds these glasses. And this is what it looks like, right? You have the, the general law. It's in the section on laws of Shabbat. Um, if you look completely at the bottom, I don't know if the laser works here. It doesn't, it's a screen. Okay, so completely on the bottom, you have the law as it appears in the Shulchan Aruch, in the main sort of text. And we do not perform marriages on Shabbat. On these little words, there is a whole gloss by Rebbe Moshe Isaris explaining, right? One doesn't marry, period. But then here he comes with his gloss and he says, and there are those who permit marrying if he doesn't have a wife and children. And this is possibly also the law that entering the canopy is allowed, even though we have not held by such a practice. We do nevertheless rely on it in cases of dire need, also because the honor of creatures is a great thing, as we have a regular occurrence that sometimes they could not agree about the dowry on Friday until the night, that we perform the marriage on Shabbat night since all the needs for the festive meal and the marriage were already prepared. And it would be a humiliation for the bride and groom if he does not marry them. However, a priori, one should be careful not to arrive at this situation. Right, so clearly the sort of bottom passage where it gets wider, that is where sort of the case comes in that, um, right, he says a regular occurrence that sometimes they couldn't agree, the case from the responsum. So we have a transition from the action itself to the justification of the action, which we saw in the responsum, and here the codification of this justification into a law. Right, and let's look at some of the elements that happen, right? What he does here, again, is he inserts all the reasons he had in the, in the law, right? He says, this is in case of dire need. It shouldn't be done in the first place, but if it happens, one should, right? It's because of this fear of, um, humiliating, um, of humiliating people on the day of their wedding. Um, but he's baking all of those qualifications and those rules as part of the a legal principle that he's now announcing, right? So he's adding a new legal principle to the mix in that sense. So what happens in a transition from an action to a justification to a codification? Several things happen, right? The action, he already did what he did, and then he sat down and justified it legally. So that is one difference, whereas in the code, again, he's giving you a principle, right? He's giving a principle, he's pronouncing, this is what you should do in such cases, right? And thinking in cases in this way is a very particular, peculiar, peculiar legal thing. It's different from definitely justifying an act you already did after the fact, but it's also different from reasoning with a priori legal principles. But if you think of thinking in cases in different fields, you find it definitely in other fields of law, but you can think of it also, for example, in the field of um, science, in the field of medicine. But it's not an empirical science where you collect all kinds of empirical evidence and then you try to get to principles. It's also not some sort of philosophical form of reasoning where you start from principles. It's something in between where you take cases and then you take together many similar cases and you build from these some sort of rule where you say any cases that look like this case, you can apply this kind of, or you can apply this kind of um, action to it. And this is what happens here. It becomes a case. Another thing that happens in a codification is that a codification is organized in a very particular way. Um, not like a real case where you have different rubrics of law that appear together, right here you have a separation, an organization. Right? And part of the, what's so attractive about the Shulchan Aruch and made it such a useful work is that it's easy to find things in it. You have different volumes. But what that does is it pulls the legal cases apart into the different volumes where they belong. And the case we're looking at in this case is two, what are the two different rubrics? The laws of Shabbat on the one hand and the laws of marriage on the other hand. And what you get here is you get it separated into the volume Or Chaim, which includes the laws of Shabbat and ritual law, and the volume Evin Ezer, where you have the laws on marriage. So if we go back to, right, so this is how it appears in Evin Ezer to the laws of marriage, where in the section on marriage law, there's specifically a passage that says, one doesn't bring a virgin under the bridal canopy on Shabbat, for by the canopy, he becomes the owner of her found objects and labor, and he will be like someone who purchases on Shabbat. That is the main text of the Shulchan Aruch in the laws of marriage. What does Rabbi Moshe Isilis add here? Nothing. He only refers it to the other section. And if we go back to what I said were sort of the two main arguments he had to contend with, 
as I said, one of them in the Babylonian Talmud, he dealt with legally. And that's the one you see represented in Orach Chaim where he gives his gloss. The other one in the Jerusalem Talmud, the way he dealt with it is saying, we don't need to take this into consideration. And indeed, he doesn't mention it when it comes up in that section of the Shulchan Aruch. He's just silent about it. So again, one of the things you can do in a code is it kind of evades certain issues by pulling them apart. He can put his strong argument in one place, and then in the other place where he didn't have a discussion about it, he doesn't mention it. Now, to look at the significance of this in terms of its afterlife and before. Um, this is actually not the first time that a rabbi did a wedding on Shabbat. It's not even the first time that a rabbi wrote a response about doing a wedding of Shabbat. It was a case long before that, which is Rabbeinu Tam himself. The only reason we know about this is because somebody, a student of his, asked him and told him that he, um, great scholars testified to me that you allowed performing a marriage on Shabbat. To which Rabbeinu Tam responds, not in a responsum that takes many, many pages like the one we just saw, but basically in two lines. And he responds, and I quote, and marrying a woman on Shabbat when he does not have children, I permitted it after the fact. And even a priori, if there is urgent need. That's all he says about it. Right, so we have here a medieval case of a rabbi who performs a marriage on Shabbat and then writes a response <laughs> about it, but very, very different. And an early modern case of a rabbi who likewise performed a marriage on Shabbat and writes a response about it, but it looks very, very different. Right, the response is, in a sense, much longer, and it makes it into this codificatory, um, codificatory literature, which gives it a very different afterlife. And in terms of its afterlife, it has, in a way, so we took a little look back at the Middle Age example, but it, it has, in a way, a split afterlife. We have, on the one hand, testimonies of this wedding that took place. So students of Rabbi Moshe Silis who said, and I remember that this wedding took place. We have even stories about it later, um, into almost the 20th century. If you look at um, 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 Rabbi Chiel Michael Epstein, the Arucha Shulchan, mentions that there was this wedding in Krakow that Ramah did, and he writes that because of that, they didn't allow weddings on Friday anymore, which is not true, because if you look at the closer afterlife, um, really just generations after Ramah, we have examples where it is specifically mentioned that rabbis would carry out weddings on Friday, and who do they cite when they mention that they carried out these weddings? They all cite Rabbi Moshe Yisilis. Um, and they cite him in Shulchan Aruch to show that these weddings took place. So we have an example in the Taz, Rabbi Deputy Alevi, who mentions that there was a wedding in Posen where people criticized the person. And he says, I don't understand why they criticized him. Rabbi Moshe Yisilis writes that it's allowed. Similarly, we have in the Bach, Rabbi Yisilis, who mentions in his responsa that he had a certain chazan, a cantor, who opposed almost everything he did. Um, and he said that he performed a wedding on Friday night. And he writes, the local cantor um, said that this is a prohibition, and I quote, as it is written in Evena Ezer, section 63, right, the section on marriage law. However, he says the cantor was wrong, for he forgot what Israelis wrote in the laws of Shabbat where he writes that it is permitted. So again, you have the person going against it, taking it from one section, and the other one saying, but you didn't see what was written in the other section. So I think what we've seen here is, in a way, this transformation that Halacha undergoes through Rabbi Isilis's writing. Isilis is often hailed in the historiography as being lenient, often, and sometimes this case is cited, Right, as being this sort of courageous figure who's concerned with the well-being of his community, with the poor orphans and the children. Um, and definitely all this is true in the sense of being courageous, in the sense of him seeing the community and their needs. Um, but I think beyond this, it's important to see also what is happening in the textual world, in the literary world, what kind of transformation he's carrying out there. And these are changes that transform the halachic texts themselves and the place of Ashkenaz in this halachic landscape and how it's represented. Codification dictated the blu blueprint for halacha, with the universal law at the center based on principles and cases, not individual decisions and occurrences. The rest of halacha would arrange itself in that pattern, and Israelis crafted a paragraph in the mode of codification and cases from this occurrence that happened to him in order to fit it into this organizational system. 
Isserlis' action, his subsequent defense and his response, and finally his codification of this action, give us a glimpse into this halachic transformation of Ashkenaz. A transformation in which Isserlis is not only the subject, but also, in many ways, its most important contributor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamara. Uh, we will take questions, if there is uh, questions. There are questions. Anybody? Yes, please. I was interested in the reference to the humiliation of the bride and the groom, and whether we should understand that to be a um, reflection on some awareness of a particular popular culture that would have been um, I say we, we often think of popular culture as reflecting issues of, of, of um, pride and humiliation, and I wondered, you know, wh how you how you would see that as um, taking into account, you know, perhaps even that particular moment and community. And um, I'm also interested in where this sits in the 16th century, uh, because of course Poland and Lithuania undergoes an enormous transformation over the course of the 16th century. And um, it's something that Jewish um, community life has to undergo some adjustment to as well. And I would just make as a final comment that although um, from, from where I sit, right, it's not a Galician story, um, it, it, especially if there is comment that refers back to it from the early 20th century or the late 19th century, as you suggested at the end, it fits into some interesting contexts for thinking about Galicia. That is to say, it bears a certain relation to Fred Rovian marriage comedy, but maybe even more interesting in, in uh, relation to um, Vispiansky's Vesela and the ways in which the solemnity of marriage is embedded in um, particular custom and ritual. Thank you. Those are very interesting questions and comments. So in terms of sort of the popular idea and the question of humiliation, what we have is this is both a halachic legal category. So kvod briot is a halachic category going back, you know, all the way, questions of, you know. Um, yeah, but I think, I think this carries through, right? I think yeah. there's a picking up of, of different themes, right? So if it was in the Babylonian example, you'll talk about, you know, if somebody realizes they're wearing something prohibited, do they need to get undressed, right? Or is it, you know, do we not want to humiliate people, for example? Um, right, what you get here is this fear of the humiliation of the bride. And I think there, especially the way in which he describes it, I said it's almost literary. I mean, you don't often get this in responsa that he's describing, you know, the shadows getting longer. He's describing the fact that she's wearing a veil, so it's sort of externally visible. You hear the sort of the chatter going on, right? She doesn't know what to do, and the female neighbors come and tell her to immerse in the mikvah and get ready for the wedding, and sort of everybody knows what's happening, right? It's both very public and very intimate, and it's sort of, I think, very much <laughs> clued in and sensitive to that type of humiliation. So I think, you know, it is a legal category, but in, in many ways it's a legal category because it's a, it's a human category, right? And in that sense, right, there's different ways of, of picking it up and of course ways that are very sensitive um, to right, whatever situation <coughs> here. I mean, in terms of right, this not being strictly Galicia, I mean, again, the Rama, I think, remains a, a cultural hero later too, in terms of even if you think of him as, you know, like a popular almost, right, the, there was, um, you know, they had for his yard site, they would have, you know, happenings on his grave and, you know, candles it and prayers. And so in, in terms of, you know, the, I wouldn't say worshiping, but right, the, the seeing him as a hero representing some sort of type of Ashkenaz that he represents and continues to do, I think it's, it's definitely there. Um, I mean, I don't know how it would fit into the genre of, you know, writing about marriage, but it's fascinating, and I would, I would love to, I would love to hear more. All right. Um, thank you, Francois, and then uh, Adam and Michael. Please make your uh, comments short and sharp, uh, not contra uh, uh, paper. Okay. Thank you, so, Tamara, for a great paper um, to see the the handicraft of codification. Um, 
I want to know about the reach of the of this codification and and whether you could engage with the ideas of of uh, Reiner about the Shulchan Aruch as as produced by by Moshe Isselis was was something like a constitution for Polish Jewry uh, that it was a, an idea of a, something like a national in quote I mean in inverted commas uh, codification or whether he had all of all of Jewry in mind or all of Ashkenaz. Thank you. Thank you. You want to respond right away or it's to better to in terms of time management? You tell me. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, take the mic. Yes, so my question actually follows on from Francois's question, and that is um, this very interesting aspect of this is the move from um, local custom and halakha to a more general, much broader, whether it's Polish or whether it's Ashkenazi, well, that's a discussion you could go on for a long time. But what was a local decision that Remar made for his community, he later transforms into something which is not just for his community. Even though the later people talking about it, they always talk about it in terms of it happening in Krakow. But there's something going on there which is very interesting. Um, and the second thing was more of a question, what is the status of the responsum? What, what kind of a text is that? Why, why did he write it? Why might he have written it? And who might he have written it for? Sure, thank you. Um, are there any more yeah, questions? Yeah, Michael Silver, Dr. Silver, please. And uh, I'm just, uh, just a very short question. To what extent any of what uh, uh, the Rama writes found its way somehow into Takanot Krakow. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so in terms of thinking about it, I think both your questions are, are very much in the same line, right? As a as a constitution or as right something that is, you know, for what for what level or how global is it in a way? Right? Which I think is what you meant by reach. In terms of reach, you know, Physically, how far did this spread, and who was it read by? Very, very broad, right? It was printed and distributed very broadly. Um, in terms of sort of the legal reach of it, um, I think that's precisely what happens here, right? By both unifying local, right, various local customs into one unified Ashkenazi representation. Um, you obviously get erasure of smaller local differences, but what you also get is this sort of representation of Ashkenazi Kalacha that can stand alongside a Shulchan Aruch, right? That can be represented in that sense as, as the law, and I think that's what it did. I mean, definitely everything, everything Elchanan Reino wrote about Israelis as creating the Shulchan Aruch, I would definitely ascribe to. Um, and it's, in that sense, it's building that legally, um, it's right. It, it's shaping it into something else, but something it can stand there as being there for an alternative. So you have this sort of it's local, but it becomes translocal, um, and in that sense, it becomes it comes to resemble law much more. I think that's where those elements of it, both the, the material elements as well, of it being um, not just written but printed, right? So you have a combination here of something changing in the genre as being written as a code, but also almost materially, right? Being a sort of written law as opposed to a more oral law, being a more stable printed law as opposed to this more fluid law. And I'd say Joe Davis has also, Joseph Davis has also done important work in terms of its printing and the reach, as you say, right? And sort of how far, how many communities are included in this and how far Ashkenaz do we mean when we talk about it, specifically when we talk about the different, right, printing it and how it spreads in that sense. Um, in terms of the audience, um, I mean, he deliberately frames it, as I said in the talk, I think we should see this as kind of an open letter. But he frames this as this sort of, I've, I've heard there were rumors and grumblings and people disagreed with me, here is my defense. Right, at least at the level of the response. At the, at the level of the code, there is something sort of more general going on, but I think it's important there also in terms of you know the literary aspect of it. To think of it, um, to think of it as, on the one hand, I think in the responsum, he is much stronger in terms of he is confident that what he did was the right thing to do, and then he goes ahead and, and sort of 
um, defends it. In the code, it's in a way much more nuanced, right? He says it's only if so and so, and you shouldn't do it a priori. So he sound right. The, the the confidence is not front and center. What is front and center is sort of this. Well, only in such and such cases. But on the other hand, he's prescribing prescriptive law, right? He's giving a new rule. So they're doing different things in different ways. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer regarding the takanot um, in this sense. I mean, again, there are stories later that, you know, rabbis have made a takana not to do weddings or these kind, right? There are stories later that this act somehow had an echo in that sense, um, but we don't, we don't have evidence. This is what happened. It's more of sort of like a, a memory or a, an invented memory of what happened as a result of this wedding. Um, and they, they talk about it as there's been a takana not to do weddings on Friday afterwards. But again, we don't, we don't have it sort of written down. And we, definitely from the evidence, it seems that people continued um, to do weddings on Friday. <laughs>